subscribed welcome back my darling and if you have not yet subscribed subscribe subscribe and join a part of our family and our community that we have growing here on YouTube also while you're down there subscribing because I have faith that you will also turn your notifications on for all notifications and become a part of the Morgan Shay notify gang 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 so today the final part of the Night Stalker, including my thoughts on the entire documentary. <sighs> Y'all, this one is a doozy. So before we even get started, warning. The following video is, is intended only for those of a mature audience. Viewer discretion is extremely advised. We are going to be going in depth over this entire entire documentary so we're going to be talking about all those things so if you are triggered hurt or um, anything by the talk of murder rape child i mean child abuse the basically anything guys if anything like that is hurtful harmful triggering for you in any way please click out of today's video as always, there will be other options linked up in the cards for you to go watch. Viewer discretion is extremely advised. So be sure that you have watched the other parts. There are two other videos before this one. There's part one, which is only episode one. There's part two, which is episodes two and three, and then today's. So be sure that you've watched the other two videos. They will be linked in the cards now. Also, guys, as always, all products are linked down in the description box. Also, this pajama set will also be linked down in the description box. This is from Fashion Nova, and I will have it linked as well. Getting right into episode four, they are showing photos of Richard as a child. And they're talking about his childhood, and they mention right off the bat into the very into the episode that he has been a thief since he was a kid, and a lot of the behaviors that he had as a child stemmed from the abuse that he underwent that he went under as a child. I mean, there's literally, oh my gosh, they talk about how his father would try to like punish him and as punishment y'all would literally hang him up in a cross in a cemetery and leave him there overnight. Could you even imagine being a child and that's what you thought punishment was? He literally had a cousin who killed his wife in front of Richard. So his like his influences as a child there weren't any. He didn't have any influences. They were all terrible influences. He didn't have not one single person. Like in a lot of these situations, there they had a horrible childhood. Okay, but in most of them, they at least had somebody that they could go to that to get some type of like normalcy and have some type of childhood. You know. He didn't have anybody. All of them were completely just n not the vibe. After they go into a little bit more detail of Richard's childhood, they then go over to this librarian. And he worked for um, one of the libraries there in LA. And he's talking about like a normal day. Like back then, libraries were the place. You know, in 1985, they didn't have what we have. You know what I'm saying? They didn't have like a com computers, iPhones, like they didn't have that. So they went to the library for their information. He's basically just talking about how busy it would be. It would be like one patron after another, after another, after another. Like it was all day, it was constant, it was busy. And he talks about this customer he gets. And obviously it's the Night Stalker, it's Richard. And he talks about just the way he moved and the way that he carried himself, that it was terrifying. Like he was wearing like a black ACD shoe shirt, his 
teeth was like rotting out of his head. You know, he, he had very bad body odor, which was one of the most common, you know, things that was said about Richard, you know, by witnesses was that he smelled incredibly bad. His teeth were bad. He had dirty hair. He said, you know, his body odor was like the worst he had ever smelled. He compares it to a goat and then goes on to say that his eyes were like nothing he had ever seen. They were like these dark, dead eyes. And he compares Richard's eyes to like an animal or a beast that like means you harm. Like you feel terrified when he's around. And if you're wondering what type of books Richard was looking for at the library, it was on horoscopes and torture. If you remember in the last episode, remember they got the name, San Francisco did. They got the name, Richard Moranes. And so this then scans over from the librarian. We're over now, we're talking to Costello and he's saying, you know, the captain calls him and Gil into the office and he's like, hey, we got a name. And he's like, what do you mean we got a name? And they're like, San Francisco got the name. I'm gonna mispronounce his name probably the whole time. I know that I've mispronounced it probably already, but I went and looked just for the record. It's Richard Ramirez. So we're gonna to refer to him as Richard the rest of this, but it's Richard Ramirez. Now this excites Frank to no end because Frank's like, okay, this is great because if we have a name, we can just, you know, look at the fingerprints and we can match the name to the prints. This is great, this is great news. Because remember that print that they got off the mirror from that orange car that was down in Orange County? When they looked in the system, there were like eight other different Richards. But when they put that print in, there was only one, there was one match. One Richard Ramirez, and they're like, okay, this is our guy. And Frank talks about like how his record was just like, he calls it lightweight. Like it's like petty theft, you know, he had stolen a car or two, but like he literally went from like one end of the spectrum all the way to the other. And Frank just says, you know, that's how you just never, never know. Also did have a booking photo of him as well. So they took that booking photo to their informant and was like, hey, you know, is this him? And he's like, yep, that's the guy. They end up getting on a conference call. It's a bunch of the different officers from Orange County and all over. Basically, they're all getting on the phone with the people in San Francisco, with the chief of police there. And they're trying to just make sure that they're on the same page. And they're trying to decide whether or not they release the information to the public and let the public know like, hey, this is the guy, like releasing his mugshot that they had, releasing his name, like releasing that information, or should they wait? Now, the captain in San Francisco, he told the other detectives beforehand, he was like, there's no way we're coming out of this meeting and we're not releasing the information. This information is being released. But Gil and Frank were like, no, let's get him in custody because if we release it now, he's just gonna jump jump beat. He's gonna, it's gonna be a chase. The chase will be on. God only knows when we'll get him. And Gil says, you know, he remembers saying like, please give us 24 hours. We will get him, please. Like, you know, if we release this, like he's gone. Like. Lord only knows when we'll get him. And San Francisco just didn't want to sit on this information. They were afraid that, you know, somebody else may pass at the hands of the Night Stalker. And Gil was like, you know, I know it's a hard, you know, it's a tough situation. It's a tough decision to make. But we may lose people anyways, because if he goes on the run, Lord only knows when we'll catch him, how many people we could lose then if he goes on the run. And the thing that San Francisco was worried about was like, you know, not only could we, you know, pot potentially could someone else lose their life if we don't release this information, 
but also, do you know what the media would do to us if they found out that we had this information and we didn't release it to the public and something happened to somebody else? Like, that would be the real situation. So, San Francisco releases the information. And it went on the 11 o'clock news, which even till this day is the most, like, viewed news broadcast is the 11 o'clock news. And Frank says that they were pissed. They were pissed because they just knew that he was keeping up with the news. They just knew that the Night Stalker was watching every single newscasting anytime his name was heard. They knew he was watching and they were terrified. They were terrified that he was going to run. However, what they would come to find out is, is that this would help them. Having his picture out there and what he looked like would end up inevitably catching Richard Ramirez. After his photos were released and his name was released to press, they go back to the librarian and he talks about how on certain days of the week, they would go to this restaurant and eat and he decided to grab a newspaper before they got sat down and he remembers seeing his face on the paper and being like, oh shit, that's the guy that was in the library. And of course he calls and lets them know like, hey, this guy was just in the library here in LA just a few days ago. And this is when like the hunt happened. Like everybody knew what he looked like now. They could put a face with the net with the Night Stalker name. They had an actual name and everybody, it was a community cry for help. They were all looking for this motherfucker. It wasn't just one or two people, no. The whole damn California as a whole was looking for him because he had went down the coastline, baby. He had hit LA, Orange County. He had been down to San Francisco. Like everybody was looking for him. You then have the victims' families. And one of the victims' granddaughters, she talks about the first time she seen his face in, in the paper. And she said, you know, seeing it was really hard for me. And there's a recurring theme that is mentioned by all of these people, where they, whether they be victims, family members, um, surviving victims, people who work for the police, what have you, they all talk about his eyes and just how dead his eyes looked. And that was just a reoccurring theme, but I couldn't imagine losing my grandmother to this piece of shit and then seeing like his face and knowing he's out there somewhere, you know? They end up finding out because Frank knew that, that he just knew that as soon as Richard seen this on the news and or in the paper or whatever, that he was gone, that he was gonna, he was gonna try to run. And so they start looking at all different, you know, means of travel with his name and they find out that he actually uses the Greyhound bus station. So they end up putting detectives and everything at the Greyhound bus station. They have them everywhere, buddy. And guess what? They find out that Richard went to El Paso to visit family and he's coming back to LA. So they put him there, they're there, they're watching for him. And matter of a fact, guess what? He comes off and he, has, he doesn't know because he's not been in LA. So he has no clue. He has no clue that they know his name. They have no clue that they know what he looks like. He has no idea of none of it, y'all. He gets off this Greyhound bus station. Now, of course, they had the officers dressed as if they were like, you know, um, homeless. However, the problem with that is, is that their hair isn't dirty, they don't stink, their teeth are nice. So as soon as Richard sees them, he knows that they're the police. He knows it. So this is where the chase really happens. Also, side note, I just wanna talk about this palette I just got. This is the Makeup Revolution. This is the Ultraviolet Reflective Palette. I just wanna talk about this shade right here, Oasis, this blue. Look how freaking pigmented that is, y'all. How gorge, that is super gorge. Just wanted to mention that. He starts to run, okay? And he ends up going inside of a liquor store. Now, remember, detectives are on his tail. He isn't sure at first if it's for him, but he ends up going into this liquor store 
and on the page of every single newspaper is his face. And this is when he decides to go ahead and hop on one of the little buses. And, you know, people are starting to call in and say, hey, he's on the bus, he's on the bus, you know? Somebody that was actually on the bus ended up calling into the police. He gets off the bus and calls into the police and says, hey, he's on this bus. And he starts to see everybody staring at him and he knows, he knows that they're looking for him. He knows. So he starts running, buddy. He starts running. He runs across, they're like six lanes worth of traffic. He runs across the interstate and he ends up running into like a residential neighborhood. Frank said back in this day, tracking someone was looked a little bit different than what it looks like now. So back then he was literally being tracked by all of the citizens and the people who were calling in being like, oh my gosh, he's here. We just seen him here. He just ran across the interstate. And they literally were able to track this motherfucker down by citizens who were calling in, reporting him where he was. How wild is that, y'all? After he ran across all lanes of the I-5 highway, he ends up running into a residential neighborhood. And once he gets into that area, he actually tried to carjack one guy, and this guy wasn't having it. This guy was not having it. He fought him back. All of the community on this street, they all get together. And as a unity, they literally arrest this guy. As a community, they arrest this man. They literally, they end up beating him in the head. He ends up having this mark on his head. But as a community, they end up getting this guy tied down. And there's like a little voiceover of Richard um, doing an interview. You'll find out later he ended up doing like one interview the whole time that he was in prison. And it's from this interview. And he says that, you know, he had people chasing him. He looks down at the end of the street and he sees a patrol car coming down. So he just ends up sitting down on the sidewalk. And while he's sitting there on the sidewalk, remember, it's just one patrolman that's pulling down to arrest him. And he's sitting there on the sidewalk. All these people are like hollering at him, you know, cussing at him, you know, just so excited that he is in custody and that he's caught and they don't have to worry anymore. They can finally sleep at night. And when the officer gets there, you know, he's, he's like, God, I've got to control this crowd. He's trying to get Richard to confirm that he is the guy and Richard ends up just saying, it's me, that's me, that's, I'm the guy. And Richard ends up saying, you know, if if I had a knife, this would be different. They, you wouldn't be so cocky if I had a knife, you'd be running for your life, you'd be scared, you'd be terrified if I had a knife, da 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 da. And ends up spitting on the people in the crowd, spitting on them. Oh my gosh, and they actually show like, actual footage of him in the police car that day in this portion of the documentary and it's so eerie y'all then they end up going to the lady in the documentary the one that believed in gill in the beginning that the um child or what they call in the documentary kitty cases were linked to these murders it goes to her and she says, you know, they get a call that they needed someone to come down to the LAPD and basically do all of his identification stuff. So basically take his photos, um, take his, uh, his prints of his fingers, all of those things. And she goes, she goes up there and she ends up not being the one to do it because she was, she said that it, he was just so terrifying. She said that his eyes, she mentions his eyes and talks about just how horrifying and just uh, like, she said, it just made you feel completely eerie. It made you feel as if like, and you'll hear Gil explain later, like Gil literally thought that this man was going to levitate during the interrogation with him. Like he was very eerie, very scary very intimidating so she didn't even do the stuff she had one of the girls that worked with her ended up doing it because she knew that she didn't want to do that the uh, you know i think her name was kathy she didn't want to do it so she was really glad that her friend ended up like doing all that stuff and they show the photos that were taken 
This was one of the parts where it shows his eyes and I like actually looked. I don't know why, but even in movies and stuff, I'm like scared to actually look at the person. I don't know why I'm like that, but I've been like that since I was a little girl. And he is terrifying. Like his eyes, they look like something off of like a goblin. Like it's just oh, so eerie to even think about y'all. So they go into, they take him into interrogation room. It's Gil and Frank. And Frank is the first one to speak. And he says, hi, I'm Frank Salerno. This is, and he starts to introduce Gil. And he says, oh, I know who you are. You are the one who caught the Hillside Strangler. And he was so, he idolized the Hillside Strangler. And you'll find this out, like, he idolized him, idolized him. Like when he found out that the actual jail cell that they were gonna be putting him in was the same cell that the Hillside Strangler had been in, he was so happy, they said. Like he really idolized this Hillside Strangler. Like he thought that he was just the greatest. He admits to basically, and as Frank describes him, as like a student. He literally started to like study these other murderers in the way that they took other people's lives. And he admits that he studied the Hillside Strangler and took into account the methods that he used when taking someone's life. And Gil says that he literally called Frank Salerno like Mr. Salerno. Like he looked up to him so much because he knew that he had been like in the same presence as the Hillside Strangler, but he looked at Gil and this is what Gil says, quote, just another Mexican. And so Gil decides to use that to his advantage to maybe try to get um, Richard to open up to him a little bit. He starts talking to him as if like they're on the streets because he knew that Richard was from the streets and Gil also grew up on the streets. So he starts speaking in Spanish and using words that people on the streets would often use. And this would basically warm Richard up to Gil. So this is the part where Gil literally says that he thought that Richard was going to levitate. So Gil starts asking him like sensitive questions about his childhood, which like we mentioned in the beginning, he had a really like rocky childhood. Like it was not the best of childhoods in any sense of the word. And they're talking to him, uh, Gil's talking to him about it and asking him questions. And he has his head down and like his arms, like his hands are in a fist and they're on the table and Gil says all of a sudden when he starts to get to more like more sensitive subject that's when Richard's hands would like start to rise up and Gil said in that moment for like a millisecond he literally thought that Richard was about to like levitate and start like crying on the walls he said that he was so eerie he had just this eerie like weird presence about him. After they had uh, arrested Richard and they started to like transport him to the other jail, it was like a freaking like lynch mob outside. Like people from all over wanted to get a sight at Richard. Like they were all pissed and they had heard that somebody was out there and they had plans to literally like gun Richard down. So they had all kinds of officers out there like making sure that nothing was gonna happen and that they could get Richard transported safely because Gil and Frank wanted to make sure that this motherfucker rotted. You know what I'm saying? Like they didn't want him to go down like that like something easy. No, they wanted him to have to stand and watch and hear all of the shit that he had done. With women and just this like Hollywood obsession just because he, no matter like what way they're famous, even though he was famous for literally killing all of these people and doing these horrible things to these children, as they're driving him and transporting him to the other jail, there is a woman standing on top of a truck with her shirt open flashing him. And as I get into more detail about how people, like women behaved with Richard, it's like, 
that is so disturbing. I mean, the whole way to this other jail too, y'all, they had to have like a motorcade. They had, you know, motorcycle officers in front, motorcycle officers beside of them, helicopters over top, motorcycle officers behind of them, regular police officers in front, beside and behind. I mean, people were thrilled that he was arrested, but also people wanted him down too. I found this so funny. Remember Laurel, the news anchor, the one who, you know, tried to like say she was going to release the information about the AV issue in the last episode? You know, <laughs> I found this so funny. When the news came out that they had caught him and that he had been detained, in the documentary, she's like, do you want to know where I was? I spent all this time on this case, and do you want to know where I was when they announced that they had caught this motherfucker? I was getting my hair cut. I thought that was like, karma's a bitch. Victims' families also talked about just how happy they were that it was like the community, that the community caught this man, you know? And I think that that's an amazing story as well. I didn't know that before this. Of course, I knew what the, I knew that the Night Stalker was about Richard Ramirez. I knew that, but I didn't know that like, it was like a community takedown. Like as a community, they were over this motherfucker. Now, remember how I told you all that Gil and Frank put Richard in the same cell as the Hillside Strangler? Well, Frank goes a little bit more into detail at, at this portion and, you know, explains a little bit more into detail as to why they did that. So, they were really like playing a card here, okay? Because they seen how jazzed Richard got just even talking about the Hillside Strangler and hearing stories about his capture and different things like that. Frank knew, okay, if he gets this excited over this motherfucker, let's put him in his cell and let him get real jazzed up about it, you know? And then he'll end up like spilling some beans. And it worked, boo. This very night that they caught Richard, Gil had a wedding to go to. And he talks about how when he walks in, everybody's like saying, oh yeah, that's him, that's him, that's him, you know, that's the one that caught him. And Gil starts, you know, saying how, you know, at, in that moment, he just wanted his wife. That's all, he, he just wanted to see his wife. And so he's looking for his wife and he walks inside. I just thought this part was so sweet. And he walks up to someone and says, where's my wife? And I just thought this was so, so sweet. And he walks up to her and he says, it's over. You can come home because remember in the last episode she left because she was so scared for her kids she lit they literally left the house uh, after the arrest of ramirez they set up a lineup okay and of course richard is one of the guys and they bring one of the girls from the kitty cases and she's the one who speaks through the documentary and they line them up and have them all say like Where's the jewelry, bitch? And Gil says that she raised her little hand and she says, I have a question. And Gil's like, yeah, sweetie, what is it? And she's like, do I write the number two or do I spell two? And number two was Richard Ramirez. So this is when they had the, you know, they had his idea, you know, they knew. Okay, this is a thousand percent the guy. The court hearings was like a freaking circus. Not only was Richard playing up to the crowd, helling out hell Satan in the middle, but also he had some pretty out there attorneys as well who did not give two fucks, y'all. Like, they literally would say whatever. They'd scream at the judge, like, completely wilding out in the courtroom. I just found this just absolutely bananas. Super important to mention that they had also decided to drop the kitty cases because they just didn't want to put the kids through that. So as a mutual decision, and plus Richard was already being charged with 13 plus murders. So they knew that he was going, that he was going down. So they decided to go ahead and drop the kitty cases just so they didn't have to put them through that. This is where they go in and they start talking about all these little huzzies 
who literally started sending Richard photos of themselves naked to the prison, showing up to the court hearings because they wanted to be with him. And this made him so cocky, y'all. They literally show clippings of him showing up to court with like, literally trying to be Johnny Cash, showing up in, you know, a suit with his hair down and curly, and he's got black glasses on. And one of the reporters who was throughout the documentary, he says that this is just the Hollywood effect. You know, regardless of what they're famous for, there's just some women who just want to be a groupie. And it doesn't matter what they're famous for, whether they're a singer, whether they're, you know, an actor, or whether they are a serial killer. These women are obsessed with the idea of being with a famous man. And it literally shows clips of actual women in the courtroom actual photos that these women sent Richard Ramirez and this reporter said something that makes a lot of sense like they're looking at him as like this sex icon and he's looking at them like they're dinner like duh bitch did you not think about how he's literally hurt all these people and killed all these other like what the fuck is your problem bitch like Oh my God, I have such an issue there. Like, that makes fucking no sense to me. Like, how could you ever find that shit fucking sexy? I need to know right now. Remember the woman that I mentioned with the, like, heart glasses in the first episode? The one that went to, like, the thrift store on her lunch break? She mentions this, and she <laughs> literally says, quote, Well, I'm sorry, but I think they're the dumbest bitches ever, <laughs> end quote. And that's, like, the... That's funny, but that's the truth. Like, are you fucking kidding me right now? At the end of it all, of course, he was found guilty on all cases. And literally, literally, y'all, a month and nine days before my fucking birthday, he was sentenced to death by the gas chamber. However, he would end up passing away a couple of decades later, and he passed away from cancer. So now let's get into my final thoughts. All right, y'all, so final thoughts. My final thoughts are this. If you are into true crime, this is a must watch. However, I will say out of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of true crime documentaries that I've seen, this is probably one of the more in-depth true crime documentaries that I've seen. They go into detail, honey. They show photos and video clips and different things like that. So I would keep that in mind. It can be very triggering if you are triggered by anything like that. But if you are a true crime console like myself, I do recommend it. I do think that it is also interesting how they went into a little bit more detail with this case since it did happen so long ago, you know, it's nice to be able to learn some more of that information because I didn't know all of that about this case myself. And I also do love documentaries who, when it's not only just about the killer, when you also get to learn about the victims, the victims' families and different things like that, I think it's just, you know, it just brings a lot more to the documentary. So I do highly, highly recommend it. As always, the documentary is linked below. It's on Netflix, um, which if you've made it all the way through quarantine and you have not watched Netflix, kudos to you, bitch, because I really need to know, is there anyone out there who made it all the way through this fucking quarantine shit and you have not downloaded Netflix yet? Let me know if you've made it down below. Obviously, Richard was a fucking scumbag. And the fact that he didn't die by gas chamber is really fucking disappointing. But he did die from cancer. I'm not sure what one they didn't say in the documentary. But still yet, you know, he only spent a couple of decades on death row. And then he died from cancer. So... How that happens, I'll never understand. That is the end to The Night Stalker. If you have a series that you would like to recommend to me, please let me know down in the comments below 
What would you like to see me break down next? Maybe I'll pick yours. Let me know down below. Be sure to like this video. Not only does it help me out and help me out in the algorithm, but it also lets me know that you guys enjoy these beauty and documentary breakdown videos. Be sure that you do subscribe before you leave and turn your notifications on for all notifications. Become a part of the Morgan Shay. Notify. Gang, gang, gang. Also, be sure that you do follow me on social media. Every platform that I'm active on is linked down below. And until next time, my beautiful little baby darlings. Bye. Thank you.